I'm Danielle Goonan, Managing Director of Economic Policy Investments at the Rockefeller Foundation. Today, I'm sitting down with Professor Dorothy Brown, the author of The Whiteness of Wealth. Professor Brown, thank you so much for being here. It is very exciting for me as a New Yorker to interview a fellow New Yorker, Bronx and Brooklyn, straight from the Rockefeller offices, everyone at home. So Professor Brown, your book, The Whiteness of Wealth, um, was a critical book for myself and my team to read this year because we are working on tax policy. So I want to dive deep uh, into the book with you, but also just get your thoughts more broadly on tax policy and what we in philanthropy can be doing to make sure that we are addressing the deep inequities within the system. So um, many of us come to this work first and foremost because of very deep personal experiences. I come to this work for personal experiences, and it was evident in your book that you come to this work for pers from personal experiences. Can you talk a little bit about that for us? Yes, I would say I kind of got uh, dragged kicking and screaming to this work because I went into tax thinking it had absolutely nothing to do with race, which was a plus for me. Growing up in the South Bronx, dealing with racism uh, at an early age, I didn't want anything on the job substantively to have anything to do with race. I knew I wanted to be a lawyer, but I wasn't quite sure what kind of law. And then I took a, I majored in accounting. I took a tax accounting course and I said, that's it. That's what I want. It's just about numbers. I love math. Well, lo and behold, I'm doing my parents' tax returns. I'm an investment banker. My mother's a nurse. My father's a plumber. And I'm making by myself as much as they are combined. And I'm noticing that while I'm paying more in taxes, I'm not paying a lot more in taxes. And I should be paying a lot more in taxes. I couldn't figure out what the problem was. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I have an LLM in tax from NYU. I know what I'm doing. It was a very simple return on each of our parts, but something was wrong. Well, I you know, finished the returns year after year, went on to my work, and it wasn't until I became an academic that I read an article. Well, one, as an academic, you actually have time to read what you want to read. When you are practicing law, you're an investment banker, during the day you're working on what your clients want you to work on. So that's one of the luxuries of being an academic. And I read this article towards the end that said, how do you know there isn't a race and tax problem if you don't look? And it was written by a mentor and someone who was brilliant and who I respected. So I didn't dismiss it. I said, there must be something here. So I picked up the phone. I called him. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. And he said, good for you. And then I found out the IRS doesn't collect statistics by race. Uh-oh. How am I going to write about race and tax if the IRS doesn't collect statistics by race? Well, I became a bit of a detective. And whatever I read... Anything about race, I put my tax lenses on and, and could see if I could figure out how this could apply in tax law. And I read an, a report by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights on the economic status of black women. And there was a line in there that said, married black women contribute 41 percent to household income and married white women contribute 29 percent. Now, anybody else would say, oh, yeah, black women work more than white women, blah, blah, blah. To me, it was tax gold. Oh my gosh, because what did I know? I know that when you contribute 40% to household income, you pay a lot more in taxes because you're married. When you pay, contribute 29%, you pay more, but not a lot more. The penalty, which we call the marriage penalty, which is defined as when you get married, your taxes go up. And it's the opposite of the marriage bonus, which is defined as when you get married, your taxes go down. So, so I found that black married couples were more likely to pay higher taxes than white married couples. And it explained why my parents' tax bill was so high, because my parents made roughly equal amounts. Every year I did their tax return. They were like within a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks. And for some reason, I was always rooting for my mother to make more than my father. And when she did, I was like, yes, mommy won. <laughs> Yay, ladies. And then when my father made, okay, daddy had more overtime. And what that report led me to do was to get Census Bureau data analyzed. And it showed that when white couples got married, their taxes went down because they got a marriage bonus because they were more likely to be in households with single wage earner spouses. So typically the man worked in the paid labor market and his white wife worked at home, didn't earn income, and they got a tax cut when they got married. Couples like my parents, which are disproportionately black married couples across the income spectrum, when they get married, <clears throat> their incomes are contributed roughly 50-50.
like my parents. So it, it showed me that my mentor, Jerome Cult, was right, that there is a race and tax problem, but you don't know till you look. That's amazing. And I actually would love to ask you a, a question about Professor Jerome Culp because I mentors have played a really important part of my life. So I'm always interested in who um, who mentors who and how folks ultimately land where they are and land within the scholarship that they're focused on. Can you talk a little bit about his scholarship and how it more broadly has impacted your work, but why the way he looks at scholarship is so important when we think about equity issues? So Jerome wrote about race and the law, and he wrote about it broadly. He taught <clears throat> the labor and employment law. He taught torts. He taught con law. He looked at how the law reified racial stratification. And he looked at how the law disempowered black Americans. And the article that I read of his was toward developing a black legal scholarship. He was making the argument that black law professors should specifically look in their area of the law and ask, what does race have to do with it? Which is why I I took it to tax, but he was basically making the challenge to all black law professors in whatever area that we were teaching. So the thing I loved about Jerome, and he died way too soon, um, was he was fearless. He took on the establishment, he took on white scholars, he took on Judge Posner, he took on whoever he wanted to take on, and he did it masterfully. And when you finished reading his article, you were like cheering, go Jerome, go Jerome, or at least I did. I'm sure Judge Posner didn't, but I did. <laughs> and it was really a model for me as to how to be. So I've learned to be fearless in writing about race and tax because the typical tax academic is a white male who thinks race has nothing to do with it thinks it's all class, and the only thing race might have to do with it is that blacks are disproportionately poor. As one told me, my work was irrelevant because blacks are disproportionately poor and don't pay a lot in taxes, right? So that's how these, the typical white male tax prof law professor has dealt with my scholarship and has dealt with the topic generally. So Jerome was a model and a hero and an encourager. That's beautiful. Well, your job, I would say, does his scholarship justice because what you do so powerfully in every single chapter is delegitimize the many narratives we tell ourselves about how to have the American dream, right? Yes. Through marriage, through education, through home ownership, through a good job. Can you summarize your research for us in the book and broadly, what did you find about these many narratives and how they are just not true, especially for black Americans? So what I found, found was, and it's why I titled the book, The Whiteness of Wealth, that our American system of building wealth is designed to build white wealth. It's also designed to take wealth away from black Americans. And one key way in which that's done is through tax policy. There are lots of ways it's done, and we've seen it before, but nobody really thought about how tax policy, which was hidden and invisible, specifically because the IRS doesn't collect and publish statistics on race, was part of the problem. So writ large, my book shows that when black and white Americans engage in the exact same activity, tax policy puts its finger on the scale and benefits white Americans while disadvantaging black Americans when we engage in the same exact thing. And I think that's one of the things that struck me so much in your book is how the tax system really rewards white wealth and almost blatantly punishes people who don't have wealth, particularly black Americans in this case. Um, can you tell us a little bit, how did we get here? Yeah, that's a great question. So how we got here, when you look at the legislative history, so what's funny is I teach tax. I've been teaching tax since 1991. And it wasn't until the mid-90s that I started thinking about race and tax. But honestly, it wasn't until I started writing this book over the last couple of years that I started paying attention to the dates of the cases in my casebook. So how did we get here? We got here for the most part because of rich white taxpayers in the early 20th century deciding they didn't want to pay as much in taxes and taking it upon themselves to change the law. That's how we got here. So what most people don't know is in when the 
progressive income tax system came into being in 1913. The only people who paid taxes were the richest Americans, and they were white. And who were the only people who had the resources to fix that or to change that? White taxpayers, right? So I have these cases that I discuss in the book from the 1920s and the 1930s, and it's like, duh, these are white taxpayers who were one of the few paying taxes, and they said, uh, we don't like this, and we're gonna fix it. So how we got here, most of our tax policies in 2021 date back to the first half of the 20th century. And think about that. The first half of the 20th century, there was no Brown v. Board of Ed, there was no Civil Rights Act, there was Jim Crow was legal. We shouldn't be surprised that we have a tax system that disadvantages black Americans when their roots trace to Jim Crow. Well, talking about race, talking about Jim Crow, talking about the inequities in the tax system, I sit on Rockefeller's equity and economic opportunity team. So all day long, we think about how do you bring practically to life equity within our economic system and with economic policies. When I think about equity, equity means to me acknowledging first and foremost that we all start at very different places and making sure that our policies account for that. And I think your book did a such amazing job highlighting the fact that black Americans, when it comes to wealth, are starting at very different places than white Americans. So when you think about the tax system, what would equity mean to you if it was applied to that system? When I think about equity in the tax system, I would think about a system that wouldn't advantage one race while disadvantaging a different race. And my ultimate solution that I talk about in chapter six is a tax system where income is taxed the same, whether it's from stock or whether it's from wages. And we would all have this income subject to the progressive tax system because I think there's symbolism but importance in higher income Americans paying taxes at a higher rate. So if we had a flat tax, Richer people would pay higher taxes because 10% of a million is more than 10% of 50,000. But that just seems wrong. There's no way a millionaire should pay the same rate as, well, the way I put it is there's no way Jeff Bezos should pay the same rate as a worker in the warehouse, right? So we should have a progressive tax system with very few loopholes. That's the problem. If you have a system with very few loopholes and deductions, you can't pile on. So I think a fair system treats all income the same and basically dismisses deductions because they privilege lifestyles. They privilege, you know, home ownership. Why on earth are, do we have any tax subsidies for home ownership? In light of the fundamental premise of our tax laws that say personal, family, and living expenses are not deductible. So we can deduct mortgage interest, but we can't deduct rent. Okay, something's wrong with this picture. So we don't bar personal family living expenses, we just bar personal family living expenses that black and brown Americans are more likely to use than white Americans, and how, that's what's wrong. How does the government get away with that? Because the IRS doesn't collect statistics by race. Why, why? Oh, that's such a great question. So one argument is the IRS says, if I don't know race, I can't be discriminatory. The other way says, but you're discriminating even though you don't know. So your refusal to continue to not look means you're okay with black Americans being audited more, you're okay with black Americans paying higher taxes. So the IRS has gotten away with this and continues to get away with it. Earlier this summer, there was a hearing on Capitol Hill and the IRS commissioner said, oh, that's Treasury's job. Now, that's wrong because the IRS has a statistics of income division. It's their job to publish statistics based on tax returns. And there are ways to get at this, whether it's zip code and surname, whether it's getting researchers to help with this, there's a way to do it. The IRS refuses. And Treasury, quite honestly, in my opinion, is dropping the ball. They need to do more. They need to, the IRS reports to Treasury. I have somebody reporting to me, telling me it's my job. When they get replaced, the person who comes in behind them will understand it's their job. This ain't complicated. Now, would we have to legislate this or is this just no. through regs? It's, okay. it's, it's, not even, it's not even through regs. It's the Treasury Department just telling, telling them, them what do to it. do. And if you can't do it, we will hire someone who can. But it's, I think part of the problem is 
people are afraid that, well, uh, what are we going to do if we find out, you know, white people are paying more? It's like, hello, can we get the data? Right now, black Americans are being harmed. And every day, the data isn't made publicly available. The harm is kept invisible. And worse, probably being made worse and worse. It's being made worse and worse. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Well, and it's also interesting because we already report statistics on race for a whole host of other yes. issue areas. So how yes. can the IRS claim they can't when we do it in housing, we do it in healthcare, we do it across the board, education? We do it for government agencies that don't have a division on statistics of exactly. income, right? And now we have President Biden's executive order that says, I want the government across, the federal government across agencies to be responsible for disaggregating data by race. So where is that? Nowhere. So there's a disconnect between what President Biden's executive order says and what Treasury is doing and what the IRS is punting at. They, they keep saying we can't be racist because we don't know race data. But you know what? And I, I did an op-ed about this in The Atlantic recently. There's research that shows employers discriminate on the basis of names. You know what tax returns have? Names. So don't tell me you don't know race when there's research that says ensure employers can figure it out without. It. So more needs to be done. There doesn't seem to be any sense of urgency in Treasury to get it done. And to say I'm disappointed is more than an understatement. OK, so in your book, you mentioned the term horizontal equity. Can you talk about a bit about what it means more broadly, but then how it would be applied to the tax system. So horizontal equity is a fundamental analytical tool for deciding whether a tax system is fair. If two taxpayers making $100,000 of income don't pay the same amount of taxes, then we would say that horizontal equity is violated. So two taxpayers with the same amount of income should pay the same amount of taxes. Although our own tax code violates that, because if one taxpayer has $100,000 from wages and one taxpayer has $100,000 from stock income, the stock income taxpayer is going to pay significantly lower taxes than the wage income taxpayer. So we have this notion of horizontal equity that we give lip service to, but when we look at it from a racialized perspective, it, it fails. Our tax system fails horizontal equity because it, it treats all dollars the same and they're not even taxed the same, much less being treated the same. And is this still continuing because there, quite frankly, we haven't been fighting back. There hasn't been enough pressure to change it or for another reason. So I think most people weren't even aware there was such a thing as race and tax until my book came along. Now, I will say I've been producing scholarship on this <laughs> since the mid 90s, but nobody reads law review articles. And I will also say every time I tried to get an op ed published, it was rejected. I was only able to get op-eds published since the book came out. Before the book came out, nobody wanted to hear about race and tax. So I find that fascinating. So now people want to hear about race and tax. And when I hear from people who have read the book, they want to hear more. I think we might be at the beginning of a movement that says, when we talk about tax reform, we should ask for the racial impact. There should be a racial impact analysis out of every tax reform bill from now on. And before, people were like, that, that doesn't make any sense. And now, I think we might, we might be in a, a time where it happens. But we're going to have to keep pushing. Like I said, there's this racial equity order, and nothing's being done. So I, we, we, the civil rights community, need to push more on the tax, on the tax angle. So in the book, and I'm going to read a quote from the book, because I think it really summarized really well um, uh, this point. You state, the privileged Americans have always had power to mobilize for action when they feel that tax policy is mistreating them. So through our grant making, what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to make tax policy, sort of the movement around tax policy more equitable, if that makes sense. What we've been seeing is that tax policy sort of sits in D.C., it sits in state capitals. What I'll hear people People will tell me all the time, oh, it's a wonk's job, or people don't understand tax policy. It's super complicated. And I can't help but think that's a really paternalistic argument because people see money leaving. 
their paycheck <laughs> to go into taxes every month. And we have all of these really, what I would argue, detrimental narratives, very neoliberal narratives out there about tax policy. So do you have any thoughts or ideas on how do you mobilize workers? How do you mobilize black Americans around this issue just the way that the wealthy have been mobilized around this issue? That's such a good question. And the only thing, the only reason something is complicated is because you don't understand it. Because if you understood it, you can explain it. I can explain tax in English. I, I wrote a whole book and people who have read it have told me, you know, I understood that, right? These are people who don't have tax degrees. If you understand something, you can explain it. So when someone says that's a wonk's job, that's really a defensive posture that the wonks don't want you in their business. Because if you're in their business, you might question what they're doing and you might ask them, what impact does that have on race? They have no training on that. They don't understand what systemic racism is because they went into tax, perhaps like me, thinking race had nothing to do with it. So when I start talking about race and tax, they start feeling threatened because they don't think they're gonna have anything to say or anything to contribute and the perch that they've always held and the power that they've always maintained starts to slip away. Of course, the easy answer is then educate yourself, read a book on systemic racism and let's talk. But no, it's easier to, oh no, this is a wonk's job, it's really complicated. Except you're stripping wealth from the black community. So let's uncomplicate right. it and let's figure out how to get right. this done. Well. It, 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 to that point, um, a big part of the work we do focuses on education and advocacy, and a big piece of that is communication, and always trying to figure out how do you communicate um, these things in a way that ultimately get us the the goal which we want, which are more equitable tax policies. And to date, it's been predominantly around the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, and I would love your thoughts on that moving forward. Um, but we did have a question from one of our grantees that said, you know, how do we better communicate in a way that highlights equity and racial issues, but that still gets us the ultimate political impact that we want, right? So some people find if we talk about it in a certain way, we're not gonna get the committees to do what we want. So we hide behind this technocratic language. Do you think that's real or imagined or, or we're just playing into sort of the status quo around how to talk about these things? I think that's playing into the status quo. I will tell you when Bloomberg Business Week put me on the cover before the book came out. I was approached by uh, Congress. I was approached by staffers. I've since testified twice, um, once before the Senate Finance Committee, and right. So I've tested. So it's not true that there are no. There's no one on the Hill, and these are not just our black and Latino, uh, Lat Latinx Congress members. They're white members of Congress as well. So. I think it's about fairness. And I think white Americans do not, many white Americans, not all, do not believe it's fair for black Americans to pay higher taxes solely because they're black. And I know this because I've gotten emails from lots of white people who don't know me who send me emails and say, this is outrageous, what can I do to, so I think you need to come with data, which is why my book has data, right? And I think you need to present it in a way that makes it understandable. So the notion that we have to ignore the reality um, of who's harmed and who's helped, I mean, by that stretch of the imagination, we'd never get the Civil Rights Act. Right. We'd never get any of the legislation that we've got. And yes, we're having trouble getting a Voting Rights Act, yeah. but there's a lot of support in the country for it, even if Congress can't get its act together. So, you know, I think part of it is it's an easy out to say, oh, I, you gotta be careful. I think the earn income tax credit is a, is a perfect example of this. The reason why we needed this expansion of the child tax credit into the earn income tax credit, the low income um, workers of the earn income tax credit is because when the child tax credit was first passed in the 1990s, it excluded low income earned income tax credit recipients. Why? Because the Republicans in Congress said it was welfare. Now, whatever it is you think welfare is, most people don't think it's when you work. You can't get the earned income tax credit if you don't work. So that was a lie and the Dems didn't push back. So they bought into the lie and the deal was made, okay, we're not gonna let really low income uh, children reap the benefit of an expanded child tax credit, and we're gonna audit 
we're going to audit the daylights out of EITC claimants. Uh, why? Because there are errors. Yeah. Why? Because it's complicated, not because people are sitting around trying to do fraud. But if you believe it's welfare, if you say it's welfare, that's a racial code. All those black people sitting around waiting to get their government checks. Excuse me, you have to go to work and you're not waiting around. It's you work full time and you don't make minimum wage and how are you gonna feed your two kids? The, I believe the Democrats dropped the ball, quite frankly, in not pushing back because what we have decades later is an extremely complicated earn income tax credit. That means earn income tax credit claimants have to go to pay tax return preparers because they can't figure it out. In fact, research shows a higher percentage of EITC claimants use tax return preparers than the average American. That can't be right. But because the narrative is it's fraud, no one on Capitol Hill is pushing for simplification. If it was simplified, we wouldn't have the error rate that we do. And a recent report by the inspector general showed the error rate's still high. All this auditing is not helping because it's not the problem. The problem is it's too doggone complicated. When I teach this in class, my students' eyes glaze over and I go, see? And you're in law school and this is hard. Imagine not being, you know. So it's, it's allowing the narratives in whatever area, because you know they're gonna come. Well then you, like the narrative on how do you get ahead in America? You, you know, get married, you buy a home, you get a, go to college, you get a good job. And what I've shown is if you're white, that works. If you're black, it doesn't. You have to overcome all these obstacles. Pushing back on the reality of the narrative is really the job of what we're going to need to get fair tax reform. In order to simplify the EITC, what, what should we do? And do you see any of it happening right now in any of the bills that either passed Congress or are up for potential passage either through the the reconciliation bill or anything else that's up there right now? No, I've seen nothing. Um, the expansion of the child tax credit is fantastic, right? But I've seen nothing pushing, I'm, I've seen nothing that talks about not auditing EITC claimants as much. I've seen nothing that talks about simplifying and how I would simplify. You know, years ago, if your tax return looked like you qualified for the earning income tax credit, the IRS would calculate it for you. I'd like to go back there. Yeah, it would require hiring more IRS agents. That's not a bad thing, right? Because what, we, what we're doing now is we're taking money out of low-income workers, a lot, a lot of money for these- It's you a know, fig they charge, those. Refund <laughs> anticipation loans mm -hmm. for yep. tax returns prepared. And we, it's not efficient. What would be efficient is getting them their money in a timely manner, you know, how- we define children as overly complicated. And if you've got two parents living in separate households, who can get, I mean, there are ways you can make this. Let's put it this way. If rich people had to qualify for the earn income tax credit, it would be simplified in a week. So that's, that's my answer. We can get it done. We, ju we just don't care. Well, going, you, ju you just raised dependents. Well, you raised children, but I want to go to dependents because your book talks about how unfair the way we define a dependence in taxes is, especially when we think about black family structure versus white family structure. Can you talk a little bit about how the ta how tax policy would change if we really took black re black Americans' reality, day-to-day -day reality, into um, into effect with our with our policies? So what research shows is black college graduates are more likely to send money home to their parents, to their grandparents, to extended family members. But white college graduates are more likely to receive money from their parents or grandparents. And the white college graduates can use it to pay off loans, can use it to buy a home, can use it to put their kids in private school. Black Americans and basically middle-class black Americans may be the first one in their family making six figures. Somebody's about to be evicted, they know who to call and, and they're gonna get the money. Well that money is not a deduction under our current tax laws because that money isn't paying for a certain percentage of the family member's household income. If we wanted a code, an internal revenue code or tax laws that benefit black, benefited black Americans, we would allow that as a tax break. Why? The reason why black Americans are, are paying 
for expenses of parents or grandparents is they were alive during Jim Crow. The federal government discriminated against them. So it's not illogical to say, well, then they need a tax break to allow them a deduction for that for their require for their being required to subsidize family members because the federal government discriminated against them actively. So, but we don't have that, right? So th that money goes out and it, it's less money in black Americans' pockets to build wealth. Mm -hmm. So you have grandparent that's being paid, but the grandchild doesn't have a 529 account to pay for college because they're paying for, you know, mama's not going out on the street. So yeah, I may not be able to pay for college, but th that is a, a choice that we should not force black Americans to have to make. Because it's a burden we've pushed on them. Yes, it's a burden not of their own making. Exactly. Because one of the other narratives that was really important for me to push back on is this notion that black people aren't frugal with their money. That, you know, we're just buying gold chains and sneakers and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, no, actually, research shows when you control for income, black Americans have a higher saving rate than white Americans. I think about my mother, who, if we sent her to D.C., she would balance the budget. This woman balanced our family Ms. finances. Miss Dottie, right, balanced the family finances with nothing. It's like, <laughs> I still don't know how she did it. I, make, I can't tell you how many my times more than she did. And I'm like, you know, maybe I should have had Miss Dottie take care of my finances. She, she had to do more with less, as most black Americans do. So this notion... The other notion is, you know, we don't pay a lot in taxes. We're mooches. Uh, no, we're not. We're paying more taxes than our white peers. So let's put that to rest as well. So it's really, you know, it's a shame that this hasn't been public before, that the IRS doesn't make uh, these statistics by race public, because it pushes back on a lot of narratives that blame black Americans for being victims of systemic racism and it's not of our own making. Or thinking financial literacy is gonna get us out of this. Excuse me, I have no money. Uh, you can teach me anything you want. I have no money. So what do you want me to do with it? I've gotta pay rent for a relative who's about to be evicted. So uh, it's not financial literacy, it's a tax system that doesn't strip black wealth every April 15th. Well, I want to dive a little deeper into the chapter Black House, White Market, because I found that chapter to be absolutely fascinating. Um, you show us that it's the preferences and behaviors of white homeowners that are driving the housing wealth gap, right? Yes. And then that's something that usually people who work on policy like me are totally leaving out when we're promoting policies, yes. right? And I, as someone who works on policy, I found myself scratching my head because I was thinking about, okay, can we legislate our way out of the problem? And are there policy solutions to this problem? And I'd love your thoughts on that. Like, how do we get out of this? So the problem is the return on investment. If you were in a black neighborhood, your return on investment is gonna be significantly lower than if you're in a white neighborhood. However, the net wealth of black homeowners is significantly higher than the net wealth of black renters. So that blog post that said, oh, it's really good that more black people don't buy homes, it's like, hello, that's right. We need to think about policies that give a return on investment that's equal in one neighborhood to the other. So I'm gonna tell you, um, Natalie Moore wrote a book called The South Side, and it's about Chicago, and she, in talking about the South Side of Chicago, Chicago had a program where if you moved into a black neighborhood, they guaranteed you, you wouldn't lose money on your house. And they set aside money in this fund. Nobody ever drew on the fund. Which tells me they didn't move into those neighborhoods. So I don't know that there's an incentive that you can, now you could say it was just one example. The fact that it didn't work in Chicago doesn't mean it won't work elsewhere because after all, we think about Chicago, that was a city that Martin Luther King couldn't change, okay? So Chicago's got some game when it comes to racism, okay? So maybe we need to try it someplace else first. But I'm not convinced, um, it, to me the solution is a guaranteed rate of return to black Americans in the neighborhoods we live in. Not making us have to live next door to white people. Um, I'm trying to remember, there was a story recently about 
um, was it in Wisconsin? A black man and his realtor were uh, handcuffed by the police when they were looking at a home. And I checked, and the, the percentage of blacks in the neighborhood were less than seven, were less than eight percent. But that's the kind of harassment you put yourself through when you're black and one of the few black Americans in a neighborhood. These were people looking to buy, they, were, they didn't even own. I think it's smart for black Americans to not want to live in an all white neighborhood, even though it's a good financial investment. So I would want a return on investment in the black neighborhood to be guaranteed equal to what the return on the white. How do we do that, through government policy? Well, it would have to be through a fund, right? It would have to be through money set aside that would be calibrated to the appreciation in the white neighborhood and taxpayer dollars should be su should support it. Okay, so your book also talks about the difference between income and wealth. Right. And several times you remind us they are not the same thing, right? And black Americans face gaps in both of these things. But policy prescriptions, at least from how I understood your book, but correct me if I'm wrong, often focus on the income gap. They're not focusing on the wealth gap. So should we be prioritizing one or, all the, or the other in terms of finding solutions? And what policies should we be thinking about or promoting that specifically focus on the wealth gap? So I think we should do both. It's and because... You know, we know the wage gaps. We know the racist labor market. We know that women of color are paid the least. We know this, so we need to fix that. But we also need to think about wealth. So the statistic I like to talk about is what median household wealth of a white high school dropout is greater than that of a black college graduate, right? So when I say that, people's jaws go in the floor. Yeah, that's not, a th that's not a typo, that's reality. So this is how we know income isn't enough. Right? Because remember I talked about black college graduates, their income is going elsewhere. It's going to family members, they can't save it. So when we talk about wealth and what could work, I think about baby bonds, right? And I know that there are baby bonds proposals tied to income, which I have a real problem with, because the six-figure income worker has grandparents and sisters and uncles and cousins that they're paying for, and they're not going to be able to put a 529 together. So don't assume because a white person with $100,000 of income, you know, they're fine, but a black person is fine. No, they're not. So I think baby bonds tied to wealth would be a better solution than baby bonds tied to income. To income. Yeah. Which we could do. Absolutely. You could tie it to what you want to tie it to. Exactly. Yes. yes. That's great. Okay. So you talk about a lot of different segments in American society that are glorified, right? Everything from housing, education, employment, marriage, all of these things we put on pedestals. One sector you didn't talk about, American philanthropy. And since we're sitting in Rockefeller Foundation's office and the creation of American philanthropy was for tax purposes, yes. right? We all know that historically. We're yes. not going to deny that. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, American philanthropy impacts black wealth and any recommendations you have for philanthropy in terms of how to address that? Yeah, I think, you know, I think we need to use the tools we have and foundations that want to do good um, should be held to account for the good that they do. So... When you give grants, do you look at how the institution treats its black employees? Do you look at how the institution treats its um, Latino employees? Do you look at how the institution promotes? So you can, you can give pretty much any strings you want to give. And I don't think ph philanthropy does enough of that. I don't think they do enough of... I want to support this cause, but I also want to support a non-toxic environment. And often with big organizations, you have people who are repeat players. You often don't have local community organizations that are given the tools to apply for grants, to know about grants. Um, if there's one thing in my mind that helped this last election with getting people black turnout, it was the local community organizations that had been on the ground for years, not 
Washington, D.C. It was folks, in, I'm in Atlanta, right? It was folks in Georgia who had been on the ground for years working with people on get out the vote. So I think foundations need to do a better job of reaching out to local organizations that are doing it. And when you work with your repeat players, make your repeat players, put your repeat players on a hot seat. You know, all of these corporations and ph philanthropists and, and educational institutions came out after George Floyd's mur murder and said Black Lives Matter. And, you know, I was quoted in the New York Times as saying it was performative BS. Do your black employees' lives matter? Can we start there? You know, do a, you know, I don't know whether a foundation could require it, but I'd require racial audit. I would require organizations that come to me for money proving that if they're, if they're not the best in their field, they have a plan to become the best in their field. Because the nonprofit world is very white. It's been very white for years and it's white funders dealing with black problems and perhaps it's that perspective as to why we're still here not fixing black problems. So you need to, I think organizations, foundations need to do a better job of listening to those on the ground and not, you know, like so many academics, they know what's best and they come from rarefied air. You know, I am atypical as an academic, I was born lower middle class, South Bronx, I, you know, there aren't many people I run into like me. Um, and that means I have a different perspective than other people and they often don't want to hear it. But if they're coming to you for money, they're going to want to hear everything you have to say. So I, I'd say use the power of the purse more. Okay. In terms of those of us in philanthropy working on tax policy, what's your advice to us? Are there certain things we should stop doing, stop supporting, and are there certain whether it's policies or organizations, we should start prioritizing. So I would look at community groups dealing with guaranteed income programs, because I think that's really fascinating, where you've had, I think in Oakland, I know because I've talked to people, there are some in Georgia who are just starting to look at this and put a plan together for a guaranteed income program for X number of people. Because what the research shows is when you give low income people guaranteed income that gives them a dignity, they do wonderfully. They do wonderfully well. The money is well spent. So I think guaranteed income um, and, and looking at the folks on the ground that are doing that would be really, really good. Um, I would say, I don't know what you're doing in housing, but if you're not dealing with 21st century discrimination on the basis of homeowners, go back to the drawing board because what I've seen is a lot of white progressives in the space, they talk about historical discrimination and they don't talk about present day. And it's like, you could do, you, I, I, I talk in the book about um, Richard Rothstein's proposal to give like 15% of homes in Levittown to black people. And I'm like, okay, but the white people are gonna leave because the percentage of blacks in Levittown is like less than 2%. That's not an accident. They don't want 15%, you know, 15, the next 15 homes coming in and be bought by black people. So it wasn't just a political non-starter. It was a non-starter substantively because the wealth that you wanted to give the next black homeowner would evaporate poof in a week when white homeowners in Levittown started selling their homes and the prices fell. So we need to force progressives to think through their solutions from a 21st century systemic racism perspective. So no matter what the topic is, the question should be asked, I don't know what you do in your proposals, but their question should be asked, how have you accounted for 21st century systemic racism in this proposal? Something like that. I love that. Because then you'll see, some people haven't really thought about it. No, it's a very general five-sentence yes. answer. Yes. With all the right words. Lots of words. <laughs> Lots of words. <laughs> okay. I'm going to read, because I yeah, this is page 195, folks. Um, if only black Americans acted more like white Americans, they argue, the gap would shrink. Black Americans should go to college, get a job, work hard, get married, buy a home, and then we would have pretty much everything our white peers have. 
So let's see how it would play out if every black American can truly replicate white behavior, right? And then you go out and, and you go into, do black Americans want the marriage bonus? Great, let the husband work, right? And you do that for every sort of segment of American society that you rip apart in this book. I have to be honest, I cringed as I was reading that and I cringed um, because the values that are so latent in that life that you set up, right? You set up a certain way of being are not the values I want, right? So what does that say about American policy? What does that say about, about our country, about our government and whose values are most important? And quite frankly, how sort of the right way of being in American society has been framed, maybe for since our founding? So that's a great question and I'm gonna answer it in many different ways, Perfect. right? So one way is, you know, and the, the end of that was acting white isn't gonna solve it, being white is, and black people can't be white. So it really doesn't matter if we want to do that, we can't do it. And if some of us can, most of us can't, that's the key. So what the status quo requires is some black success. Because without some black success, we could say the system doesn't work for anyone, but there's always black success. People who overcame the odds, people who in spite of, people who got lucky, people, and as a result, we'll see if you could just be like that black person, when we can't all be like that black person. So that's number one. Number two, when you think about the laws and how they were created, like the joint return. You know, back in 1948, when we got the joint return, 80 something percent of white Americans were married and in single wage earner households. It's never been that high for black Americans. The joint return was put into place with upper middle class white Americans in mind. The exclusion from gain for home ownership were put in place with homeowners in mind, which at the time in 1951, the majority of white Americans had just become homeowners. A majority just became homeowners, and that's why the tax break was needed. We have these policies designed by white Americans that value what white Americans want and what white Americans do. And it's not that black Americans don't want them, it's, that, it's just that if we do, we can't get the benefits, and we can't replicated, right? We have mass incarceration to deal with that white Americans don't have to deal with. There are lots of societal problems, the war on drugs, and you look at how the crack epidemic ravaged the black community, but when we talk about opioid abuse in white Americans, so we have to be compassionate, and we have to talk about treatment. It's like, huh? When we look at the system, the status quo that's built on what white Americans want, Black Americans may not want that. I mean, research shows that black Americans do marriage very differently than white Americans. Black Americans are more egalitarian than white Americans. Is that a function of if I'm paying 50%, then you gonna listen to me? Or is it black Americans are naturally more, who knows? But we know the research shows marriage is done differently by black Americans and white Americans. I believe we should have policies that empower people to be who they want, how they want. You don't get a tax break for marriage. You don't pay high taxes because you're single. Because right now, that's what happens. There's a single, there's a, there's, no there's, kids. Right. No, no right. Yeah. I have any mortgages. I'm like, oh, government, yes. they take all my money. And I live in New York City. They're coming for you early and I often, know. right? They take all my stuff away. Why, why do we you know, encourage marriage? It, what is that? Why? So, you know, and I have something in the book that talks about the stay at home spouse. One, a cynic could argue, is about white women staying out of the labor market and not being competition for the husbands. We've got a whole lot of problems, right? So I, I think tax policy, I think wealth building policies should be designed to empower people to be who they are, how they want to be, and not, it's only a good financial investment if I have to live next to the neighbor who's gonna call the cops on me, that can't be right. So. We have a lot of these status quo narratives that haven't been examined or re-examined recently. And I think we're in a mood to say, you know, there's a lot wrong. Let's just start looking. Yeah. It's time to start looking and start changing. So your book focuses on federal tax policy. 
If you applied your research to the states, how much worse would this picture be? Yeah, state, you know, most people accept that state taxes are regressive. That, you know, whether it's sales taxes or flat tax, you know, or low tax rate, you know, in Georgia, I think maybe the highest is 6%. It doesn't matter how much it goes. So they're regressive that, that a higher percentage of low-income Americans are paying taxes than, than the really rich. So, yeah, it would be worse. And I don't know where the data comes from, right? I, I don't know where you get the race and tax data. Um, uh, I got Census Bureau data. I looked at a lot of research. It's public research on home ownership, published research on who's taking advantage of retirement accounts. There's lots of published research out there. I don't know that there is as much with respect to the states. It could be, but uh, yeah, definitely look, because state and local is as important in New York, what federal, state, and local. I just live. I used to live in New York, right? So you get the triple whammy. So it's it's important to think about that. And when you think about areas to move into, thinking about state tax systems and local tax systems is is important. Okay. Last question. What are you working on next? Well, I'm working on my next book, which is going to be about reparations. How much of um, the policies you prescribe in this book are part of your, what I assume will be some conclusions or policy recommendations around reparations and how much of it is, is, is new policy that we haven't seen yet from you? So it's new policy you haven't seen, but it's, it comes from that book. It comes from the building blocks of the book. Wow. I, I like to think of the whiteness of wealth as a very long introduction to the wow. reparations book. In fact, when I was ending the book, The Whiteness of Wealth, I knew the next book was going to be on reparations. And I, I knew it, even though it's now taken shape, but I, I knew that that's the next logical step. H how do you fix the racial wealth gap? Reparations. There is no fix to the, to the racial wealth gap without reparations. And what I was talking about in the book was a tax solution to a tax-identified problem. With reparations, it's a solution to a much bigger problem. Got it. Okay. Anything that our viewers should know that we haven't hit on yet or anything you want to fill us in on that I didn't ask? This was probably the most thorough interview I've ever had, and I love it. I and was an A student just like yes, you. Yes, and as you can see, I've done a lot of interviews, but this one, I can't, I literally cannot think of anything. Yay! <laughs> My teachers would be so proud. Yes. Thank you, professors. <laughs> this was awesome.